Look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. This is Dan Durbin. This is Jason J. Lewis, the voice of Superman on Justice League Action. This is Mark Wade, writer of Superman Birthright, and you're listening to The Krypton Report. The Krypton Report podcast is dedicated to all things Superman, Supergirl, and the planet Krypton. We discuss movies, TV, game, comics, and all things DC. So join me, Tyler, with my co-host James and Jania. Welcome to the Krypton Report. It is I, your host, Tyler, the Superman of Blue, the man of tomorrow. And today I have a special guest. This man I got here is very knowledgeable about the one thing that I often say about the super fandom that I know very little about. I've been trying to get this legendary man on the show for a while, but you know, life. So today I'd like to welcome the great Mr. Sam Rizzio to the podcast. <laughs> welcome, Sam. Thanks, Ty. How are you doing? Is I'm it Ty t- or Tyler? Either. I got okay, three Ty. first names, and the fact <laughs> that I have three first names and I have nicknames off those names, I just go with whatever. As long as you get one of the names right, I, I go with it. <laughs> okay, I had, cool. I had a, uh, I had a uh, teacher in high school who I had for four years because I had him for health, PE, and then like another class he taught, and he still got my name in the wrong order. I'm like... <laughs> I'm like, I've been your student for four years, man. Um, <laughs> but whatever. Sam, it's it's great to have you on the show. Um, you know, we, we've tried before, but, you know, life happens. And then, uh, you know, where I started my monthly where I'm trying to, like, do these little segments on the different actors who've portrayed uh, Kryptonians, as I put it. You know, you reached out, like, hey, um, I liked your little segment on John Newton. And I'd like to talk a little bit, you know, about Gerard because, spoilers, people, Sam knows Gerard. Um, and I was like, yeah, that would be great, you know, uh, because you are the host of the Superboy Legacy podcast. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I grew, Superboy, the TV series, that was my gateway, or should I say my gateway drug into the Superman world. Uh, it's no secret if you've listened to Superboy, the Legacy, or just have been on my Instagram or any of my social media platforms, how much I love this series. Um, it was being a six-year-old and seeing the series for the first time in the summer of 89 um, was something like, it looked like it just, the comic books came to life. Mm-hmm. And the first episode I ever saw was the Bizarro, the Thing of Steel episode, which was amazing. Like to see Bizarro come to life, to see uh, Gerard's Superboy which, as, as a six-year-old, like, it's Superman. Like, yeah. it was just, and the action, the story was fantastic. And as a kid, you just want to see Superman do super things. And that show did it in spades. I try to, like, when I was watching the show and everything, and like, I was trying to, you know, tell my kids, like, technically this is Superboy. And they're like, that's not Superboy. I'm like, it's tricky. This is Superman when he's younger, and he went by Superboy. And my kid's like, What? I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, hold on. Uh, yeah. And yeah. You know, what's crazy for me is I, I remember the show, but what I remember is I remember the intro and uh-huh. the, and the most vivid part of the intro was the missile being shot at the very obvious now, um, <laughs> dummy, you know, yes. exploding. Yeah. Yeah. And I swore for the longest time, I'd, I'd say like there was a Superboy show. And like, no, no, you're thinking of Superman because it was on cable and it was on like the same channel at my grandparents' house that had Superman 4, I think, play every day. And I'm like, no, I, I remember this. And it just seemed like before the internet where everyone had access, you know, people like, ah, oh, no, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Are you thinking about Lois and Clark? No, no, there was Superboy. And then, of course, in 2006 when Superman Returns came out. I'm at Walmart late at night, and then there's that big display, and there sits season one of Superboy, and I was like, I knew it. <laughs> I was like, there, I'm buying this. Um, <laughs> finally, proof. Yeah, I mean, it's funny being being here in Chicago and going to a number of conventions over the years as a teenager, as a kid, a teenager, and my father taking me to different comic book shops as a kid, and buying up all the 1950s and 60s and 70s Silver Age Super Superboy comics, like, that just fed my fandom for, for the show. 
And to go to comic shops and go to conventions and ask vendors and other collectors, hey, do you have any Superboy stuff? And like what you said, uh, Ty, people just looking at you like, there is no Superboy series. What are you talking about? Like, no, there's a hundred episodes that, that were on television that, like, there was a Superboy series. you got to be kidding me. And then people are going like, you mean Lois and Clark, you mean Smallville, mm-hmm. or you mean... Uh, like the adventures of Superman. No, I mean Superboy, the TV series, which was, and it was just so funny. And there was one vendor from California, uh, Hollywood book and posters that just fed my appetite because they had all these eight by tens from the Viacom press kits and they had transparencies. And I, I can remember every time they come to town, just putting an order in and just buying like every single thing that they had and then multiples of things. So it was just like, oh, he's our good, cu- he's a great customer. We got to bring more. <laughs> so, so yeah, it was just, you either caught the show in its initial run or you didn't. And it has such a cult following and, uh, and like, in recent years, like with DC Universe app that just, you know, it's no longer there anymore. But the, one of the first things that they put on the service was the Adventures of Superboy. Which thank I, you. I loved. Yeah, thank you, Mike Carlin, because he's like, hey, Sam, we're going to post put it on there. I was like, great. Uh, and and uh, I've been a big – sorry. Oh, go ahead. And I was going to say, like, I've been a big advocate. Like, I'll say to people, like, I miss DC Universe. And they're like, well, it's on HBO Max. I'm like, no, it's not. Because what I loved about DC Universe is because they had Superboy, The Adventures of Superman, the old Shazam series, these things that were out that we can't get our hands on that really helped right. you dig into this background. And I'm like, I'm still like, please put these on DC or on HBO now because I was in the middle of season two of Superboy because I was watching – the Adventures of Superman, I was watching Superboy, like all the stuff that I had missed out on because it was hard to track, it was hard to find. Yeah. And then it went away and I'm like, oh, yeah. crap. <laughs> well, I, I think I think DC Universe was fantastic and like you said, they utilized their back catalog of their heroes like Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, even Shazam. Mm-hmm. Like they did a, a beautiful restoration uh, for the 1970s Shazam series. And I was like, wow, if they could do this with Shazam, they could do this with the Kirk Allen serials. They could do it with the George Reeves. That needs a total restoration. Come on, Warners. Like, yeah. uh, Superboy, it'd be a nice to do an HD transfer. They have the 35 millimeter sitting there in the vault collecting dust. Like, I mean, there's so much you can do with the super properties that, uh, that you could see a nice return if you're Warner Brothers. But again, unless they have the idea, it's not going to happen. Right. You know? And I mean, by putting it out there on their streamer, it lets people know it exists. I mean, oh, for example, my friend Zach Moore does a podcast, a retroactive podcast of Always Hold On to Smallville. And I met him online back when he started in season one. When Smallville came to Hulu, instantly it found a new fandom that – he started having more people wanting to be on the podcast and we're talking about it. And the podcast kind of grew because people could find the show. And if they put Superboy on HBO Max, there would be people who would find it and get this nice little window into part of their super fandom that they don't have. They've lost touch with because – or they never knew it existed because it right. is almost like this kept secret. Right. Um, it's funny because a couple years ago – uh, you know Tracy Roberts, who played Darla, uh, Lex Luthor's uh, Miss Tessmacher mm. on, on Superboy. Um, she was invited to the Superman celebration, and I remember getting a message from her saying, Sam, I'm so nervous going. I don't think anybody's going to remember me. Um, so we go. You know, I did some photos and stuff for her, for her table. We get there. The line wrapped around the building. That was fantastic. She looked at me. She's like, wow. Uh, She didn't stop signing from the minute she sat down to the minute she left. And I think it was like a three-hour signing each day. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. But the the best thing about that weekend was there was a a screening of two episodes um, that were an hour. I mean, Superboy runs about 22 minutes each episode. So we posted two episodes together. We edited two episodes together. 
uh, the Road to Hell episodes. Mm. Um, and we did a screening in Artist Alley, and it sold out. So many people were in there. She she got in her Darla, her white Darla costume, and did a skit with Josh Boltinghouse, the, nice. the, super, the official Superman of Metropolis. So they did the whole skit, a little skit from Roads Not Taken, which, in my opinion, two of the best episodes of Superman on film that you'll ever see. It was the first multiverse uh, concept on on film. Mm. So uh, they did the skit. Everybody stood up at the end of it and cheered at the end of the screening. And we're like, oh, my God, I've never seen this. This looks amazing. This is... Uh, this is like the Christopher Reeve films all over again. Like it's just really, really well done. There's a, there is a charm to the series. Yeah. You know, and and it's it's like I said, it's this window into this excitement because it's this part of the super fandom that I haven't got to fully explore. And there's stories and characters and things that come to life, and the cast is great. Even yeah, even yeah. when they changed over uh, the well, cast. It still was a very fun group of people to watch and be part of. Well, it's funny because talking with Stacy and talking with most of the cast from that first season, like Jim Calvert, Michael Mano, who played Leo, uh, Lex's best friend, the the one thing that I've taken away from everybody from the cast is how much they loved doing the show and how much uh, love and care and sweat and tears they put into... Uh, doing all 100 episodes or doing that first season, if you're John Newton or Jim Calvert, they loved being part of the Superman legacy. And even to this day when I talk to them, like they have no problem sitting down and talking about it because they love the character and they loved what they contributed to, to the series. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's that first season, it's it's really rough. It's funny when you, when you said, Ty, like, uh, finding the season one box set in 2006, getting that box set was so hard with mm. Warner Brothers. Trying to get the series out was like a nightmare um, because it was like the 1966 Batman yeah. series with Adam West. You never thought you were going to see it because there were so many people that had their hands in the copyright or the production of the series. They want their slice of the pie. So we thought we were never going to see it. Um, you had Carthage Productions and Viacom own a piece of Superboy. You had DC and Warner Brothers. Uh, and then you had Ilya Salkin's company own part of it. So the series never was in syndication because Warner Brothers and DC put a lien against the series after the show ended because they wanted to start their own Superman production. Uh, they saw how, just how, uh, they saw the returns of Superboy and it being in the top 10 syndication, and they were approving the scripts from the show, and they were like, you know what, we we want to do our own Superman show. We're seeing how successful Superboy is on television, uh, next to the Star Trek The Next Generation, and My Secret Identity at the time. Uh, they're like, we want to do our own. We've given you four years of Superboy, we, we're going to develop our own Superman show. So, yeah, I mean, and Superboy just kept getting better and better and better with each passing season. That first season, it was really tough. I mean, you had the production team from the Superman films with Chris Reeve come to television, and you could see in those first 13 just how tough it was because they didn't know how to build up to a commercial break. They didn't know mm -hmm. how to do a, a teaser of an episode. <laughs> like, I mean, television for Elia and his team was something completely new. Yeah, um, they, they were finding their footing, and like and like you know, they the show in the second season for those who don't know, like had a kind of a, a soft reboot. It went from being what forty some minutes to twenty some minutes. Uh, some cast changes, mostly all the cast, but yeah, Stacey. three three fourths of the cast. They should have called the series. It's funny, the Adventures of Lana Lang because she was the only consistent one through all four seasons. She was the only. Uh, cast member that wasn't replaced. So, yeah. But um, it's, I think, other than Batwoman, w which just happened recently where they recast the lead role, I think this is the only other time in television history where they recast, 
like in the middle of a run, mm-hmm. like in a, a, a complete casting overhaul, which was insane. And I think there was just in TV Guide, there was an article on TV Guide that mentioned Superboy and Batwoman together, which was hilarious. I was like, wow, they really did a deep dive. <laughs> like, yeah, wow. I mean, I remember that was kind of when they announced that Batwoman was going to be recast and, pe- you know, there was the debate before they announced it was going to be a new character. Um, you know, about how, who they could get to replace or whatever. That's like Superboy came up in conversations. Yeah. And I was like, okay, see, this has happened before. And it's that thing that people forget happened. And the one thing that I've kind of been really like, I don't want to say upset, but is the lack with everything that's happened with, you know, Lois and Clark and onward, there's always that paying tribute to legacy of Superman, right. right? But nobody's f- like paid legacy to Superboy. Um, you know, like for example, I think Gerard would have been a perfect Jarrell. Uh, I think Stacy and Gerard Gerard would have been perfect for Jarrell and Lara uh, for the current Superman and Lois show. You know, um, I agree. I, considering I agree. they're not, they didn't use Jarrell that much. I just thought that would be a great. You know, they didn't get in crisis. I was like. Could you imagine that kind of a payoff to just have him, you know, as Jarrell? I'm like, why, why not? Like, why hasn't someone been like, you know what? Let's get someone from Superboy <laughs> to appear here. Because, I mean, think about uh, Lois Lane has almost the tradition of having a previous Lois Lane represent her mom. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Erica Durance. Yeah. yeah. Um, Terry, Terry Hatcher. Hatcher was on Smallville. Yeah. And... Yeah. Um, what do you call it? Um, Noel Neal was yeah. Lois Lane's mom in Superman the movie. Mm-hmm. And so she was in Superman Returns as Gertrude. Yeah. Yep. Um, Margot so Margo was in Smallville too. So yeah. So we've had, you know, all of these people play, you know, L- Dean Kane was in Supergirl and Smallville. Right. Uh, you know, Terry Hatcher was in Supergirl also. Um, J- J- uh, Mark McClure was in the Smallville. Helen Slater was in Supergirl and Smallville. Mark Walker was even in Justice League. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> right. Um, the, you know, there's all this legacy of having people appear in other super-based projects. We could go on and on. Um, but nobody has really been like, hey, other than um, I care, Sherman Howard voiced in the Justice League animated series. Like, it's not coming to me right now. But he yeah, did provide um, some vocal work. Yeah, I mean, he's been consistently in DC animation. She, he was in Batman Beyond as David Prowse, uh, or David Powers. Yeah, uh, the the character that was trying to take over Bruce's yes. empire. Derek so, Powers. Yeah, he was in that entire first season as the radioactive, or he he was infected with those what like gamma rays or something, yep. whatever. Light. Was, Light. Yes. Yeah. But, like, he's been consistently in DC properties, DC animated properties. Um, it's funny. I'm trying to think who else. Gilbert Gottfried, who was on Superboy as Nick Knack, voice Mixes Pitalik yep. in Superman, the animated series. So, like, there's been some influences of getting some actors from Superboy, but it's not – I don't think it's on the forefront of, like – the production teams from Superman, the animated series minds that, Oh, you know what? These guys did Superboy. I could be wrong, but like, I don't think like, um, I don't think they know. I think they just see like, Oh, you know what? He's got a really unique voice. Let's bring him on. So, and I mean, I'm still fingers crossed, you know, praying that if they do, cause one thing, spoilers (laughs) for Superman lowest season one, but there's a lot of allusion to Lara. And we don't actually get to see Lara in season one. You know, I would love to see someone reach out to Stacy <laughs> to be Lara. Like, I would lose my yeah. mind just because it's kind of that awesome deep dive of like, oh my gosh. She could, she is in such perfect shape. I, I was just with her and Alon Mitchell Smith this past summer at the Superman celebration, which was my com- first convention in over two years because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's for most people, but, uh, you know, being up on stage with them, I think that was one question I posed to Alana and Stacy. Would you guys be interested in coming back to, 
a Superman related property like Superman and Lois. And Stacy immediately said yes. Uh, she would love to come back. And it's not like she hasn't been trying. And Gerard's is the same the same way. Um, you know, I kind of keep them apprised of what's going on in the Superman world, which is pretty funny. <laughs> um, but like, uh, you know, I think Stacy. I think the Lara thing would be interesting, but she makes such a great villain and she has such fun like on days of our lives, you know, as, as yeah. a villain. So I would love to see her come back in a villain type of role, which would be really cool. I mean, um, it would be easy to do, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, yeah. I, I, it's not like you say, like she's still working. It's not like she's retired and yeah, they have I mean, to bring her out of retirement or something. She's a working actress, so yeah, she's been consistently on television, on soaps, uh, in prime time. She was on Heroes, and I think the very first episode, she was uh, Parkman, who the the, oh, the yeah, police yeah. officer who had the telekinetic. He could read people's minds. And she, she was his boss that first season. And I was like, oh, my God, there's Stacy. Like, she would be and, – and she came across as very, like, villainous in, in Heroes. And I was like, oh, it'd be so cool if they beef up her role and trying to figure out, like, Parkman's, like, secret and all that stuff. Like, how do you know going into these crime scenes? How do you – how can you figure out, like, what's going on here and her trying to find out, like, how is he doing all this? That would have been so cool if they went in that direction, but they didn't. They – uh, they used his partner, uh, who was who was with him the entire time. But it would have been cool to see her, you know, in a in a role like that, a more villainous role. Um, you know, I asked her recently. I'm like, have you, you know, would you get back into DC? Even if it's not Superman, would you get back into doing something in the comic book sense? And it's funny. She said to me, I think at the Hollywood show right before the Flash. Uh, season one started. She goes, it's funny you asked that, Sam. She, I just did a reading for Nora Allen oh. role for season one wow. of The Flash. And, like, I got, like she said, she got in the room. She did the reading. They really liked her. And then uh, they just wanted to go with somebody younger for the role. And I was like, oh, my God, that would have been amazing. If you back into the DC world as Nora Allen, that would have been fantastic. And it would have been a great deep dive you know, oh, Stacy was in Superboy all these years ago, and like people could go back and find out more about her. But uh, to get into the Flash, that would have been amazing to see her as Nora Allen. That would have been a, so cool. That would have been cool. Yeah, that's really. I mean, so it's you know, I was going to say like the Flash has done a great job of pulling out characters from the Flash TV series and actors yeah. mm -hmm. who were like the mayor was like the cop, like one of the beat cops in the old Flash series. Yeah. Um, and it, like, you know, we could go round and round, but like Superboy is just, I feel like the one DC show that has not gotten yeah, they, they have connection. They haven't, yeah. They haven't really, sorry, Ty. No. They haven't really mined the Superman or the Superboy television series stars. And uh, for one for one thing or another, I think one of the main reasons why they haven't done this, and this is just me putting two and two together, is that Superboy was not a Warner Brothers uh, production. I think if I think if Superboy was a uh, Warner Brothers production, you would see more. You would you would have saw more marketing for the series back when the series was on. You would have saw the series in syndication on like me t v or um just this the series would have been uh utilized more in syndication, and more people would have discovered it um I think it being a Viacom property and it being leased by Warner Brothers to Elia and his team at the time i think and it being the first uh Superman series since what the adventures of superman yeah i want to say uh on television i think his production team didn't know and viacom didn't know how to utilize the superboy brand at the time um so i think that's that was a, a big thing and them just trying to figure out television w with this with the show those yeah. first two seasons because like you go and look at season three and season four and it's basically the X Files with Superboy or Superman. That's what I would say. You yeah. Know? It's it's you know, people are always like, Oh, he's super like 
he's a he's a man. Why is he a boy? And you're like, well, it's kind of that they couldn't use Superman to do it, so they used Superboy, right? Um, to be able to produce their show. And but no, that's a that's a really good point, really good thought um, of why it didn't grow and why they kind of pushed it back and down. And it's sad because it is a, it, in this time where we're all discovering these properties and you have such a resurgence of these old shows and actors coming Mm -hmm. back. The fact that this piece is not being respected or getting its chance to find its new audience and live on and Mm -hmm. uh, it's just messed up. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Boil it down. I mean, yeah, it's, it's messed up, but I think in the last 10, 15 years, uh, I, I just want to give a shout out to my buddy Matt Patterson at uh, WB Archives. I think without Warner Brothers, that subdivision of Warner Brothers uh, being created where they could just, hey, you know what? We're going to take a TV share- series that didn't do so well uh, market it through Warner Home Video, but the fans are clamoring to get the rest of the series. Like, let's put it through our... Warner Archives division will put just the episodes on there, the best looking episodes on DVD and market it towards that fan community. And in recent years, WB Archives has grown because of that and people love it. Um, You could thank WB Archives for releasing the extended cuts of Superman the movie and Superman, um, uh, what is it? The special edition that they just came out with a couple years back. Yep. About so, them. yeah. About, I about the Supergirl, um, you know, because that was something I didn't have in my collection. And if you could find a DVD copy of that, it was like, <laughs> ridiculously priced. Yeah. And then they put out the Blu-ray of the mm-hmm. one cut, and then there's a DVD of the other cut of Supergirl in the Warner Archives collection. You know, I bought that. I bought the three-hour cut of Superman the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I totally am with you on that, like, if they would release like a box set of Superboy, yeah, yeah. I mean, they did. They it, it was I think the longest release between season one and season two in history. I think it was like six years. Superboy season one came out in two thousand six. In I want to say what May of two thousand six. That, that sounds re- about right because that was the ramp up for Superman yeah. Returns. And I remember them marketing it in the back of the the Superman prequel, Superman Returns prequel comics. And it was like, oh, uh, here's the super legacy of Superman. And there's John Newton on the cover uh, in one of the box sets. I think there was like six different box sets. There was Kirk Allen. There was Superboy season one. They were marketing that Lois and Clark was coming to DVD. Mm -hmm. And the George Reeves series was coming to DVD. Mm -hmm. So they were marketing all those at the time. And uh, I remember... My friend at Superman homepage, I, I, shameless plug, sorry. <laughs> but uh, yeah, That's what we do. <laughs> yeah. But my buddy at uh, who passed away a couple years back, my buddy Barry Fryman messaged me and was like, Sam, I'm doing an interview with Ilya Sulkin. I'm like, you're kidding me. He's like, yeah, you know, in the course of the interview, uh, he told me that season one of Superboy was coming out. I was like, Really? And uh, he sends me the interview, and I'm looking, and, like, Ilya says, like, oh, I'm sending everything to this. It was New Wave Entertainment that was producing all the extra features for season one. So Barry's like, you know what? I'm going to give you my – I'm going to give you uh, Sam's phone number, Ilya. Call him. He has all these different ideas on how to market seasons two, three, and four. And at the time, I think I had my website through Angel Fire – if, if anybody remembers angelfire.com, <laughs> I think that was the first, like, website that I – and I did it all by myself, like, building that website through Angel Fire. And then it went to GeoCity, and then I bought a .com, uh, which was Superboy homepage at the time. Um, but, like, it was funny to see, like, how – how all these people remembered the show, but they had no access to it mm-hmm. through for years. And like me and a bunch of other fans were tape trading old VHS tapes back and forth, you know, trying to trying to get our all 100 episodes. So it was pretty funny. But when Barry told me that first season was coming out, I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. Um, 
And it was funny because I was working retail at the time. And I'll never forget this. It was like around this time of year, like in January. And I get this phone call. Is this Sam Rizzo from Superboy homepage? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, please hold for Ilya Sulkin. I was like, no way. No way. <laughs> what? Why would he, why would Ilya Sulkin, the, pr- the famous producer from the Superman films and Superboy and Supergirl, take an interest in what little old me here in Chicago is doing? So he comes on the, the phone and he goes, Sam? I go, yeah. He goes, this is Ilya Sulkin in his, you know, accent. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's like, I love what you're doing with Superboy. You know, and I'm like, okay, is this really a Elia? So I kind of quizzed him. I was like, did you write Dracula, uh, Young Dracula? Did you write like Johnny Casanova? And he and he started telling me stories about like producing Superboy those first two seasons. And I was like, yep, it's Elia. So for like 15, 16 years, we were friends and talking about the show. I remember doing a six hour interview on my cell on my flip phone trying to figure out how to record it. Uh, I wish I had that interview now to, to put on my podcast, but, like, I think I spent, like, six hours on the phone with him. My phone bill was outrageous <laughs> at the back end when, of the month. Back when you had to pay for minutes, people. Oh, God. And you had to pay to record it, too, because I was paying the, the service to record it. And I was like, oh, my God. He And I said to Ely at the end of the conversation, I'm like, you should write a book. Like, yeah. it was so funny. But, um... You know, and then it was it was like a great friendship for for a long time. And he would open his Rolodex to me and say, "Sam, who do you want to talk to from the show?" I go, "Uh, what?" And I was like, "Well, how about John? How about Gerard? How about Stacy?" And he's like, "Here's their number. I'm gonna call them and you talk to them." I remember geeking out and when when we have Gerard on the Superboy Legacy podcast, I'm gonna ask him about this because it was so funny. My energy, and he'll tell you this, and, uh, like, I was going to actually invite him on the show today <laughs> just to talk with us, but uh, he was he's Man, busy today. I just, but, uh, just went huge. Like, if you, you can't speak, <laughs> like, I was like... I was going to have him call into, uh, like, to my uh, my mixer, because I have my cell phone linked to the mixer, and just bring him in, and, like, it would have oh, been so gosh. funny. But uh, I would have been super pumped. Like, I would have been <laughs> right. like, oh, my gosh, like, I would have been... But, yeah. but I, I remember talking to him for the first time, and I don't really geek out when I talk to anybody, but because he was my Superman growing up, and, it, you know, to see him in that suit at six years old was like, wow, that's Superman, or that's yeah. Superboy, wow. And, uh, like, to talk to him on the phone the first time was kind of intimidating. I was like, oh, my God. Like, it would be like for you if it was William Shatner who was your hero or Adam West and... Like it, or m- meeting Christopher Reeve if he was oh, yeah. still alive. Like, um, it's like, oh my god! Like, this is my hero. Like, and um, I just remember talking to him the first time and going, oh my god, oh my god! Like, in my, I was going like a mile a minute. Like, that's the only time I've really geeked out. Like, when I've talked to any any celebrity, and it was so funny. And he's at the end of the phone call. I just remember Gerard going, Sam, I love your energy. <laughs> that was it. I mean, well, you're like, yeah. The the hardest thing for me is like, because I, I I don't, I don't want to say like I geek out or whatever. It's like I want to just talk to them as a person, but then it's like I want to talk to them, but like I want to like, hey, I appreciate your art, your work, right? You know, I'd like to talk to you, but sometimes like I don't want to be too crazy and only too in yeah. their face or yeah, you I know, like they only have so much time. It's like you know when I right. I, I met Dean Kane at a convention, uh-huh. then we got to chit chat. Like it was really cool because. I have this picture. I'll take a picture of it and I'll send it to you. It's a behind the scenes because I asked Dean about it. It's like a behind the scenes test photo. And I found this poster somewhere. Um, I think it was like a thrift store or something. And he was like, I remember, you know, we were setting up to do this. And it was a really nice conversation, you know. And I'm like, I'm talking to, you know, Superman here. And trying not to, you know, you're trying to just like you're trying to figure out how to just talk to them and not be like, Okay, I have to hurry because we're at right. a convention. Um, <laughs> you know, and it's just like, I don't, it's like, I want to just talk and not be like, trying oh, to be cool. Yeah. Trying to be cool about and, it. Yeah, exactly. Just be like, hey, I just want to talk to you as a person. I appreciate what you did. And mm-hmm. um, sometimes you're like, you don't know what to say because like you have, you have one question or one thing to say. Like, what do you do? And you're like, <laughs> without yeah. sounding like every other person that walks by. So Yeah. 
I mean, I think I think over the years that was the one I could, I could think that is the one and only time where I was like intimidated. Like everybody else, like Alon Mitchell Smith, John Hames Newton, Jimmy Calvert, especially Michael Mano. I love Michael. I love talking to Michael who played Leo on the show. I talk to him almost every week or every other week if we don't chat on the phone. And he is just so much fun. He is so humble. He's so down to earth. I think uh, this past summer I just sent some stuff to Robert Levine who played Mr. Jackson. He's 91 this year. Wow. Um, and I talked to him this past summer because he was like, Sam? I go, yeah. He's like, how do you remember the show? I was like, well, I was like six, seven years old. It was my first Superman series. Like, it was my first Superman anything. And he's like, you were the perfect age for it. Yes. And uh, he's like, I love doing that show. I love playing Mr. Jackson, which was, he was kind of like a Perry White figure. He was the head of the Bureau of Extra Normal Matters that which Supergirl ripped off with the DEO. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, the Supergirl did a deep deep dive into uh, taking some stuff from Superboy with the the Bureau of, what, Extra Department Normal of Affairs extra or normal. something like that. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I will say, uh, when you and I had talked before, you told me about how it changed to that in the later seasons. I did jump ahead before uh-huh. DC Universe disappeared yeah. and watched a couple episodes of the latter seasons, just like, like have... A yeah. feeling of it yeah. before they disappeared. And I thought well, that was kind of cool. Like you have this really interesting story that, I mean, like you said, Supergirl kind of ripped it off. Mm-hmm. But it was Clark working there as well. Like it wasn't just Superman or Superboy. Right. I'm sorry. Right. Like it was Clark that was working there. And I think I think those the best thing about those two se- – those latter seasons, seasons three and four – was that you got to see Gerard's Clark Kent come into his own. He wasn't really as bumbly as he was in the second season. As more, He was more like the Christopher Reeve mm-hmm. Clark Kent in season two, which was fine, and that's what Ilya and his production team wanted. But when Julia Pistor, who took over for Ilya the last two seasons, uh, they changed the title of the show from Superboy to The Adventures of Superboy, and talking with her, I... I posed the question, why did you guys change the, the name of the series from Superboy to the Adventures of Superboy? She was like, it was just to open the world more, to, to be able to tell more stories, and uh, and it just sounded better, the Adventures of Superboy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, she she said, like, that was her first gig in uh, film and television. She has gone on to have a great career working for Nickelodeon. She now working at Netflix, and like I, I texted her and she's like, she said to me, she's like, Sam, those, those two seasons being on that show, that was the most fun I've ever had working on a property and working on a Superman show. And she loved it. And I'm, I'm hoping to have her on the podcast soon to, to talk about it. So that'd be cool to hear. Yeah. But it's amazing having this, having a podcast and having a website and, you know, keeping this show going in a sense so people like yourself and other Superman fans can discover the show for the first time or rediscover it. And it's just gratifying when you have the cast and have other fans come up to you and go, Sam, that, that's, this is amazing. This is really, really cool stuff, and I never knew it existed. So, yeah. I think what's neat is like what you said was this was your first super experience. You know, like you experienced Superboy before you saw – I. From what you said, the, the Reeve films, like yeah, you saw I Superboy. Didn't, I didn't – it's funny because I didn't see the Christopher Reeve films till much later. I want to say like in the early or mid-90s, I didn't see Superman for a long time. I didn't know – I think I found out – I think I watched Supergirl with Helen Slater before I watched the Christopher Reeve films, which is funny. And I didn't even know about John Hames Newton as Superboy that first season – until 1995 when the show was completely over and Fox 32 here in Chicago, I think it was like Saturday and Sundays because they had nothing else to play, played the, all 100 episodes of The Adventures of Superboy. And the first episode I saw with John uh, Newton as Superboy was Kryptonite Kills, which mm. was the first introduction of Kryptonite on the series. And I was like, I remember being watching television on Fox because, uh, like, Fox was amazing back in the early 90s. You had yes, Power Rangers. You had uh, 
I mean, what else was on Fox? You had the X Files, which my aunt got me in, and I was like, oh my god, it was such a Fox was such a great network back in the day. <laughs> it was. I mean, it had, and this is a whole side tangent, but I'll say. Cartoon Network killed Saturday morning cartoons, <laughs> right. and it killed toy stores. Now, yeah. all, I have a whole tangent about that. But Fox Kids, you know, had Batman X-Men. Animated Series, X-Men, Spider-Man, X-Men. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. like, Power Rangers, and then, of course, every Power Rangers ripoff. So VR Troopers, <laughs> right. Beetleborgs. Yeah, uh, VR Troopers. Like, you see, VR Troopers was, was on Fox, too. <laughs> you know, that was – that's the ones. And then Beast Wars was on Fox, but it was yeah. in the morning. So, like, they had all the great – like yeah. material. So the fact that they were showing mm-hmm. Superboy, and I do want to point out for our listeners, Sam has said it several times. Superboy had a hundred episodes. I want to say Lois and Clark only had like 87. Yeah. Something. They yeah. didn't reach a hundred. Right. They didn't. And it's funny because the Superboy production team knew they had to get to a hundred episodes in order to be syndicated. Um, and I think the last two episodes of the series, they went back and refilmed because the last episode was going to be uh, obituary for a superhero, which was a clip show. And they, they filmed some news segments at the beginning of the episode and to book at – well, to book end the episode. And they're like, we can't end the series this way. So they went back and they did a two-part episode called Rites of Passage, which, spoiler alert, <laughs> Superboy becomes Superman at the end of the series. But they don't – give him the Superman title and like it killed me <laughs> for years. It still kills me that Gerard has not been dubbed Sir Superman or Sh- or Superman, you know, so yeah. it, it I, sucks. But come anytime on. I talk about <laughs> actors who have played Superman or like, I always bring up them because they are forgotten, you know, and left out because they're under the, the moniker of Superboy. But I'm like, you know yeah. what? It's still Clark Kent. Oh yeah, and that yeah. and that's my thing. It's like it's not like you know. Right now we have Josh Orpin over mm-hmm. on Titans, who's playing Connor Kent, and he's that, fantastic. He's yes, fantastic. He yeah, and that's that's Superboy, as most people think of Superboy. So I wouldn't count that. Or uh, Louis Grabel, who played mm-hmm. Connor in Smallville for like an episode. Right. You know, right. that's a different Superboy. To me, John and Gerard still played Clark Kent. Becoming Superman, much just like Tom Welling played Clark Kent on his destination to become Superman. And they deserve the credit and to be recognized with the other actors that have played that character. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because whenever John, I know I was supposed to do a panel with John a couple years ago at the Superman celebration at the 40th, but I got sick uh, during the course of the weekend. So I couldn't do the panel. Um, and it's funny because John, whenever he talks about doing Superboy, um, he, he always felt he hated the name boy in Superboy because he had old, he had an older brother and he was, he didn't want to be boy. Mm-hmm. So he wanted, he, he went to Ilya and the production team and was like, can we just call it young Superman? <laughs> like, and they're like, no, we don't have the rights to Superman. So he hated the name Superboy. And like, but I mean, talking about the show, he loved it. He loved playing Superman or Superboy. Sorry. But uh, years later, a friend of a mutual friend of ours, uh, an animator out in California, Rob Pratt, uh, decided to put a a short animated, uh, an animated short together on YouTube just to show what he can do. Um, He's worked for Disney. He's done amazing stuff called Superman Classic, and he decided to, he met John at a party of um, a family function. I, I forgot the story, but you, I, you should have Rob on, Ty. Sure, <laughs> sure. I'm- but uh, he has some great stories, but like he, he met John at a, at a party with his kids and said, and asked him, hey, would you be interested in voicing Superman? So John got to voice Superman, and I think they're up. They're still up on YouTube. If you go on Rob Pratt's uh, YouTube channel, you could watch Superman Classic, and he did a Bizarro Classic. And uh, John voiced both Superman and Bizarro in both of those animated shorts. And John's wife Jennifer Newton voiced Lois Lane, and she's fantastic. They're both fantastic. But uh, there's a third one. I don't know if we'll ever, if Rob's ever going to release it because Warner Brothers, he had meetings at Warner's 
about doing a, an animated Superman series. And they said, we love what you're doing, but can you please stop? Uh, he, we did, and I, I was Jimmy Olsen in one of them, which was pretty cool. Nice. I got to, I got to voice Jimmy Olsen and, uh, it was Brainiac classic. So he put his own stamp on Brainiac, uh, for one of them, but I got to see the animatics and stuff for it. It looked amazing. It was so cool, but I don't think we'll, we'll see it. Maybe we will. I don't know. <laughs> but but it was cool. I got to be in a Superman project, a little Superman project, and get to voice one of the one of the great characters, Jimmy Olsen, you know, S- Superman's best friend. So that was pretty cool. But uh but yeah, like John John got to be Superman, which was pretty, pretty awesome. He got to voice Superman. Um I know just recently Gerard got an agent. We were talking about Superman. And I showed him the first five minutes of Superman and Lois, and it blew his mind. He loved it. Uh, he has reached out to su- the Superman and Lois production team about writing some episodes, uh, and that's that's all I can say about that. But like, that's it's awesome. not. But Gerard, he loves the character. He would love. The, he's in better shape now than he was on the show, and he could still play Superman if you ask me. <laughs> he's great. So. I mean. Like I, I, I hate that they weren't represented in Crisis. Um, I mean, I would love to just him to be represented somehow in the show. If he, I think even I'm gonna throw this out there because you know Superman Lois is dealing in a post-Crisis world, and they never really did Hank Henshaw correctly. Could you imagine Gerard oh, yeah. getting yeah. to play a military Hank Henshaw who then becomes Cyborg Superman? Yeah, it'd be you know or something it, like. He loves. I mean, in the in the third season, they did the roads not taken episodes, which again, if you haven't seen it, it was different worlds on different uh, parallel worlds. It was very sliders like, mm. you know, before sliders. Superboy had all these great ideas, uh, story threads woven through those four seasons um, that kind of blazed the way for where we are now on television with DC, ad- adapting all these different versions of the characters. But Gerard got to play an evil uh, Superboy called the Sovereign. And it was it was like Red Sun before Red Sun came out. I think well, I remember... When did, when did Red Sun come just, out? 93? Mark uh, Wade wrote that in 93? And I think Road's Not Taken came out in 91? Uh, that sounds right. Let's see. Yeah. I'll look it up while we talk. Yeah, but I but that was the first real like villainous tyrannical Superman, which was amazing. He had so much fun playing it. So I could totally see him coming back and he loves playing the villain. The body swap episode where he swapped bodies with with Lex was another fun episode, which funny enough Smallville went and did years later with Lionel Luther and Clark and Tom Welling just did an interview with, with Michael Rosenbaum. And that's the one episode he remembers from the show in the 20, uh, and they did a 20th anniversary podcast and he's like, yeah, I remember doing that episode and it was so much fun. <laughs> so, it, but, it, uh, it is fun when the actors get to change up, uh, red sun, the comic was in 2003, 2003. Wow. Yeah. And Superboy was 1991, 92, so it was well before Superman Red Sun. So. I feel like it was a very influential show yeah. to creators. I feel yeah. like the people that it got to experience the show um, got something out of it that they carried on with them. And it kind of became – like I, I say this all the time, like War of the Worlds is you know, one of the greatest sci-fi things ever created. But the problem is now if you go back and read it or watch it or whatever, it feels bland because everybody's ripped it off. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like, you know, with our conversation and stuff, like Superboy had all this great creativity and ideas and other people have just mined from it. Well, I, I, th- I think a big reason why Superboy had the uh, – the, the way I like to describe it is Superboy en- embraced – the Silver Age of the comics, the Kurt Swan era, the mm-hmm. John Byrne. Even though Superboy was kind of retconned in the in the mid '80s or late '80s with the John Byrne, yeah. that look of Superman they brought into the series. Um, they had the writers who knew the heartbeat of the character, like Michael Carlin, Andy Helfer, 
Mark Jones. Um, trying to think who else, uh, Fred Freiberger, like all these guys who were in television or writing for DC. Carrie Bates was another one. He was the showrunner that didn't second Marv, season. Did Marv Wolfman do a script? I think Marv Wolfman did one. You had um, David Gerald who wrote Star Trek, the original Star Trek, write for Superboy. He wrote the, the script The Test of Time where Superboy is stuck uh, – where time is stopped because of this will-o'-the-wisp thing that uh, Lana gets whisked up into, like, in that episode, uh, in the Test of Time episode. And Clark is kind of, like, stuck in almost, like, it looked like a small, like, Smallville, and everybody is stopped, and he's like, what's going on? Like, it was such, it was very x file It was mm-hmm. so good. Um but I think the the great thing about Superboy was it embraced the comics. It embraced the silliness of those 50, 60, 70 comics and even the 80s. Um, and wasn't afraid of blazing its own path and using some of the villains that we haven't seen on film properly, even till this day, like Bizarro, who was like at first very much like Frankenstein. He's a Frankenstein character. Um, but Superboy did it in a way where, yeah, he, he's creepy, but then by the end of it, he's, he, him and Superboy realize they need each other because they have nobody else. They're brothers. And I love that, uh, at the end of the two part episode in, uh, season two, where Bizarro puts his hand on Superboy's shoulder and goes, thank you, brother, for giving Bizarro life. Great. Great, great character moments. Yeah. In 22 minutes, they, they were able to tell really good stories and really hit the heart of the Superman, Superboy character, as opposed to some other versions that we've had recently with, with Superman, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, they really understood what made the Superman character appealing for so long. I think up until that point, when Superboy came out, it was the 50th anniversary of the character. So, yeah, they yeah. really it was, home. yeah. Yeah. It came out in 80, uh, 88, so yeah. I was yeah. going to say, you're talking about talent. I mean, one talent that definitely had a huge impact is um, you t- you mentioned the Road to Hell episodes. Mm-hmm. They were directed by David Nutter, as, oh. as many Superboy episodes actually ended up being, yeah. you know, um, 21 episodes of Superboy were directed by David Nutter. Mm-hmm. David Nutter would go on to direct the pilot for Smallville as well as a couple other episodes. Then would go on to direct the pilot for Supernatural. Mm-hmm. Um, and then X-Files. The, the Flash. X-Files. Yep. <laughs> um, he is it, basically the Steven Spielberg of television now. <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah. yes, he is. You know, he, he is one of the, um, the few directors uh, that have directed multiple versions of Superman. Yeah, yeah. Uh, having directed both... Uh, Smallville and uh, Superboy, and I think Glenn Winter is one of the others who directed mm-hmm. Smallville. And well, then, um, uh, Colin Chilvers, who was on, uh, I think he was in the Superman production team. He got to direct some episodes of Superboy that first season, and it's funny because he, I think he he directed the pilot episode of Superboy, and uh, it's funny because I'm, I'm friends with him on Facebook, and I was posting some images from the pilot. And I just recently, a friend of mine who worked in the props department at Superboy had a bunch of boxes in his garage. So he was sending me these boxes. And in the boxes, we found a pair of Clark Kent glasses. And they were John Newton's glasses. So I posted a picture on my Instagram of the glasses. And I I tagged John. And John's like, oh, my God. Like, those are amazing. Um, He goes, I remember. And John sent me this text. He goes, I remember picking out those glasses uh, in the uh, production, the pre-production meeting with Colin Chilvers. So I sent the message to Colin, and he's like, "Yeah, I remember picking those the Clark Kent glasses with John." And it, like, it's just so cool, like, to have the access to these people who made your childhood. You know? Yeah. yeah so, I mean, now I wanted to ask you about this. The episode, technically, like, if you can shine some light on this, the pilot episode of Superboy was not actually aired as the first episode, was it? No. There was, there was something that happened there where it was actually aired later. It wasn't it uh, the, the the real pilot wasn't the countdown to... It was Countdown to Nowhere, 
Yeah. And uh, they they filmed it, or they used they used a different episode. Um, they used what was the episode? The episode with Lana's father coming. The Jewel of Tetra Call tested better than Countdown to Nowhere because of Lex Luthor and Michael Mano's uh, work in that episode. So they're like, you know what? We're going to go with the Jewel of Tetra Call because it's more action-oriented. Superboy's doing more super stuff in it. And uh, it's just testing better. So that's what they ended up using as the pilot, quote-unquote, pilot episode of Superboy, which the first real episode of Superboy is Countdown to Nowhere, where the group of uh, gangsters or mobsters or whatever break into Schuster University and steal this advanced laser weapon. And they Lana, who's doing a picketing against this scientific, this new advanced laser, is uh, picketing against the use of it at Schuster. And uh, she gets caught up in it, and these guys uh, break into this advanced uh, lab as Schuster football players, which is really funny. And uh, Lana gets taken uh, as uh, collateral. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a really fun episode. And there was there was another version of uh, of Countdown to Nowhere, and it's up on YouTube, and they cut some scenes out of it where Clark is meeting, is, is in the Schuster Herald, their version of the Daily Planet. Not, well, not the Daily Planet, but their college newspaper. Clark and TJ are working, and Lana comes bursting into the Schuster Herald going, is he here yet? And it's the first interview that anybody has with Superboy. So Clark and TJ are going to interview and photograph Superboy for the Schuster Herald. And it's basically, it's framed as them remembering their first encounter with Superboy in Countdown to Nowhere. So there's so there's three different versions, well two different versions of Countdown to Nowhere, but uh, they used the Jewel of Tetra Call because it had Lex Luthor in it, and it just set up the characters a little bit better than Countdown to Nowhere. Wow, I, I just I didn't know why. I just remember, um, you know, what yeah, I'm saying? They, I just remember there being something that they had done <laughs> uh-huh. to that because uh, it made it was. Because it reminded me of like the whole Firefly thing. They didn't <laughs> air the pilot for the pilot. Um, That's it, another great series. <laughs> My God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, you know, a pilot usually is written as some way of an introduction to these characters. Yeah. Uh, so but the, it's, it's, it's cool in a sense that it kind of hit the ground running that yeah. first season and was like, okay, you know who Superman is. And it, it kind of was like a soft spinoff of the Superman films. And it was the same production team and everything. So, like, I kind of like the idea that, you know what, you've seen the films come to this, and it's the same it's the f- same unit that made you believe Christopher Reeve was Superman and made you believe that a man can fly. Well, come to this, and we're going to make you believe a boy can fly. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> so. Yeah. All right, Sam, I got a few questions here for you. We're going to we're gonna kind of change gears a little bit here and just do some kind of your your whole, you know, we, we've talked about a lot, so I'm, I'm going to skip over some of these, but. Uh, Shoot, Ty, go ahead. <laughs> if you had one power from of a Kryptonian, what's the power you would take? Oh, my God. That's a tough one. It is tough because once wow. you start thinking things through a little bit, oh. you start to realize there's only one power that you can really have and probably manage. <laughs> yeah. I mean, super strength would be awesome, but I would be afraid to, like, hug somebody or, like, if I'm on, like, uh, a, like an airplane or something, if I just got mad or something and hit, like, the the tray table that, like, I'd puncture a hole in the airplane. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, flight would be cool, but I have vertigo. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Uh, where am I? Yeah, I, so I and like I, I don't know. I and I get afraid. Of, I'm, I'm afraid of heights with the vertigo thing. So like, I went to a Chicago Bulls game and I sat up all the way at the top and I'm looking down oh. at the players, going, "Oh my god, I can't do this." So yeah. so yeah, flight would be no. Super speed would be pretty cool. I would go at super speed because then I wouldn't have to fly. I wouldn't have to 
get on a train and I could be somewhere like the Flash or like Superman, and Superman is faster than the Flash uh, in the blink of an eye. And I kind of like that. That'd be so cool. Uh, you know, that's one thing I, I always liked, you know, is, yes, Superman can fly. We can also run fast, too. And I feel like once every <laughs> version of Superman, they they introduce flight, they kind uh-huh. of forget that he can actually move fast, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, and the, yeah, I mean, who wouldn't want to have x-ray visions, x-ray vision? But I'm like, mm, there's some things that you just shouldn't see. Right. <laughs> yeah, totally. no. Like, oh, micro- God, vision, I, and you micro- can't vision. unsee it. <laughs> so... Yeah. Like I was thinking about like a microvision, like you walk into like a hospital and you could see all the oh, germs. Yeah. Uh-huh. Like, yeah, no, I would freak out. <laughs> it could be like, I don't yeah, no. <laughs> so yeah, when you actually think about it, it's like, yeah, no, I wouldn't want flight. I, I mean, super speed's the only one because traveling would be so easy. But I mean, like would your clothes tear apart like the Hulk too? Would yep. I? I'd have to get heat resistant like clothing. See, that's that's why we, as as we, you know, I've asked this question. Kind of, we kind of whittle it down to the invulnerability. Yeah, because because the invulnerability helps play into the super flight, the super mm-hmm. speed, you know, and all that, and, well, and the super strength. Like it all kind of comes out if I have the invulnerability. Yeah. <laughs> then no, like I don't have to worry about stuff as much. So well, di- and different versions of the Superman character. Well, it's his aura that protects yeah. you. Oh, okay, that's that's interesting. I never thought of that. Okay, yeah, I, I believe like, that. I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, and it's like always like the little Flash has the speed force that kind of protects him mm-hmm. as he's running. You know, so it's like his clothes stay, and because <laughs> right. that would be my part. Like just oh, oh Tyler, you sped over here. I can tell because. You're wearing fire clothes. Oh yeah, my clothes are on fire. <laughs> you checked shoes? out like a firefighter as I'm as I'm like <laughs> super speeding. Like, man, that fireman runs really fast. Like, what the hell? <laughs> uh, it is funny because it's like it's like, oh, could I have just one or do I need them all like to work? Um, oh god, super breath or freeze breath would be cool. Yes, but heat vision's my other favorite because there's so many times uh-huh. I tell my wife like, if I had heat vision right now. <laughs> to cook yeah to cook stuff would be really cool but Melt i, I ice trying to get right. like my uh-huh no yeah. let me ask you this for heat vision as a fan what do you think's better like um you know like in superman returns when we see the heat vision and in smallville they kind of do this wave of like heat energy and then you know there's the classic like laser eye look which do you prefer which do you think looks better and feels better is a personal See, choice. I'm I I liked what I liked Smallville's version, like um, with the the heat waves because it's just more realistic and like. But I mean, on the on the flip side, how you not love the red laser beams? The, right. The, I mean, I mean, Superboy doing the they were the first ones to introduce how Clark shaved in the morning. In the and if you go back and watch. The, the episode A Day in the Double Life where it was like Clark's day like in that episode because uh, Mr. Jackson wants to know, what do you do with your day, Clark? Like, what do you really do? I'm going to give you this journal and you tell me what you're doing and why you're always off, you know, on these like, well, I got to go get index cards, Mr. Jackson. What? What? What are you talking about? Like, I want to know what you do at the end of the day, Clark, with your day here at the Bureau. And it was so cool because that was the first episode we saw Clark, like, uh, do his uh, shaving in the morning. And he holds up the the piece of, uh, what is it, the mirror, and he mm-hmm. shoots his, his heat vision into the mirror, and it's just sha- he's shaving with his heat vision, which was really cool. And then ever since then, everybody's doing that that bit. Like, yeah. every, like Lois and Clark did it. Uh, I don't know if Smallville. I don't think Smallville did it. No, because he never really had any facial hair. He didn't hair. have a beard. <laughs> I would definitely like to see it on Lois and, or on Superman and Lois. Cause yeah. Because uh, do, you, do you remember when they had the whole marketing for Man of Steel? Like, yes. the, how does he shave? Yeah. And, like, you had different people, like, being interviewed, like, well, I think he does it this way. or like. Uh-huh. But there's so, only one way he does it. He shoots his, his, his heat vision into the... 
the mirror and he he just moves around and they're it's super clean. There you go. Exactly. Smooth. <laughs> super <One> smooth. <laughs> right. What would you say is your favorite Superman film? Now it can be live oh, action geez. or animated. Man, you are really putting me on the spot, Tyler. Man, there's a wow. lot more in here I could dig into. But... Oh my god. Oh, how do you not go with Superman the movie? I See, mean, I feel like that's the default. So, like for me, when I answered, I was like, "Yeah, I had to think." Okay, like I feel like that's the dub. So it's like then what's it's after the that? It's the dub, but like I mean, it's the definitive version of the character. No, no offense to people that have grown up with Brandon Routh or Henry Cavill, um, and I, and for me, Brandon Routh was the first Superman I saw on the silver screen. I didn't see any of the Superman. I didn't see Superman 1, 2, 3, or 4 on the big screen. So I would say I remember the teaser trailer for Superman Returns and yep. just being so like, oh, my God, we're getting a Superman film. And we were waiting 17 years the, uh, for a Superman film. And it was like start, restart, like, oh, we're yep. you, you had J.J. Abrams. Then you – well, well, first you had Tim Burton, and then JJ, and then Brett Ratner, and so like when Brian Singer coming off of X Men Two, like, oh, you know what? I'm not doing X Men Three. I love Superman. This is going to be a Richard Donner like tribute in a way, but we're blazing a new path. And that first teaser trailer out of San Diego Comic Con with the voiceover of of Marlon Brando saying. Oh, no and the mailbox and him arriving on earth with the, the Kryptonian ship and him, you know, the, the silhouette of Brandon Routes, the, the spit curl of him looking up, it was just, and then him flying from, from space down to, uh, through the atmosphere was like, oh, wow, that's Superman. Like, I mean, I remember my anticipation. I remember being in college, uh, just checking every single day for every little nugget about that film was like, wow, I can't believe I'm going to see a new Superman film. And you had Kevin Spacey as Lex Luthor because I remember all the fan casting like, oh, Kevin Kevin Spacey uh, should be Lex Luthor. I remember them talking about him being in the Tim Burton production as Brainiac or Lex Luthor. So he, and even the JJ version, the flyby, well, we want Kevin Spacey as Lex Luthor. So he was always around the Superman uh, projects in some form or fashion. So when that came to fruition, like, oh, man, and them casting Brandon Routh in an unknown in the vein of Christopher Reeve and them saying that this is the continuation of the Christopher Reeve Superman, I remember, like, just being over the moon. I remember the hype going into that movie. So I think if I had to pick... My favorite Superman film, I would, I mean, yeah, Superman's the movie, it's the default, but I liked, I really liked elements of Superman Returns, especially that, that shuttle sequence was yep. amazing. Oh my God. I remember being at Navy Pier Chicago on that giant screen and when Superman lands the plane was everybody cheered. Like that was quintessentially Superman and you knew Superman was back after that, but, uh, but yeah, I just I wish there was a little bit more action in Superman Returns. I love Brandon Routh. I loved I loved his portrayal of the character. I just wish they would have gave him more to do yeah. as Superman and let him be his own Superman uh, in that film. That was the only criticism I had about that movie. Just I, I agree with you. You know, was the fact that they they could have made it a, a love letter to Donner, but let him be his own yeah. Superman. Yeah, um, it always boggles, it always boggles my mind that Superman Returns was in 06 and Batman Begins was in 05, and they are completely like polar different approaches to these characters. Yeah, it, it was it was funny because I remember with Green Lantern and Ryan Reynolds that was like their first like attempt at doing a DC universe, and that Green Lantern was going to lead into all these different like Superman and Batman. Um, Batman Begins, I, that was probably one of the most fun movies to go see, like especially after Batman and Robin and the mm-hmm. the the crap. I know we're getting off on a tangent. Oh, we're bit, fine. But uh, but I remember going again and taking my entire family to go see Batman Begins, and when Batman, when Christian Bale's Batman is on the uh the barge fighting those criminals, like. 
uh, was just amazing. And then him like looking over the, the skyline of Chicago on the Wrigley building. And I just remember it being like 10 o'clock at night and people just screaming at that, that uh, at the Navy pier screen going, that's freaking Batman. That's amazing. And people cheering. Like, I mean, there's nothing like uh, going to a movie and it, it just, just recently with Spider-Man, no way home, people cheering yes. for their hero, yes. not once, not twice, but over the course of several times in a screening was like, there's nothing better than seeing your hero up on the screen or on television doing what they should be doing. And it's just so gratifying. And it's like, wow, that's why we love these heroes, you know? Uh, you, you mentioned the trailer, you know, for, and I yeah. was thinking, I don't remember which movie it was because my brother and I went and did a double feature of seeing Walk the Line and uh, Harry Potter 4 back to back. And it was in one of those showings. Maybe both. I don't. I don't remember that the trailer played for Superman Returns, the teaser before of just that. Like I said, the mailbox, the voiceover, mm-hmm. and I just remember being so excited seeing that <laughs> that even though I was seeing this other movie that I wanted to, I just I left the theater. That's what was on my mind. Oh, and the music, the John Williams music, dun, 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 dun. and then he flies, and it, you see the S, and it's like, <gasps> wow, and it was just like they captured. And in, in that what minute and a half trailer yeah, was it's like a, it's barely over a minute. Wow, yeah. like amazing. The only other trailer that made me feel that way was Star Trek 2009. Yeah, the teaser, because the the, the, the the teaser and then the trailer that they had. I think it was the third trailer after. Um, just was so well done. And uh, like I'm not a big fan of recent Trek, but like that first movie, like they had a lot to do because they needed to resuscitate the Trek brand, and I thought they did a really nice job of it. And uh, I love Chris Pine. I he, do too. He's a great actor. And I love that he did his little uh, tribute to Shatner and the Kobayashi Maru <laughs> scene. Yes. <laughs> With the apple and him biting the apple, which was so funny. And him, just the way he's sitting in the chair in the, in the Kobayashi uh, Maru test was fantastic. Like, just enough of Shatner in there. But again, he got to do his own thing as as uh, Captain Kirk. And I just wish Brandon Routh in Superman Returns was able to do what Chris Pine was able to do in Star Trek 2009. Just a little bit of his own flavor as the character. Put his own stamp on Superman. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say Superman Returns was one of my favorite Superman... Is my favorite Superman film, which is... You know, I have problems with it. But... uh if you read the prequel comics leading up to that, I think you'd have a more appreciation for the film. That's that's how I look at it. I can agree with that. I, I that that movie, for many of the exact same reasons that you stated, has a special part like in my heart. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just came at the right time in my life that I needed that movie in my yeah. life. Like I, my favorite belt buckle is the Superman Returns belt <laughs> buckle, and I I wore that thing until like it it uh-huh. popped in the back, and I um and it was just a great time. With that film, like I, yeah, I saw that film. I think four times in theaters. It was I saw it when it was in the IMAX 3D, mm-hmm. where it would be just certain scenes are in 3D. So like you're watching it, and like the like you said, the airplane rescue would start flashing. Like put your glasses on, and yeah. then put them on yeah. for that scene. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's it's not perfect. There's parts in it that I'm just like, uh, there's yeah. parts in it where I'm like, you could have done more with this character. Like he could have got some more action because. It is 2006, and you're bringing Superman to life. Well, um, I, I think, and I've said this on other podcasts, I think when you ask your, when you're reintroducing Superman to an audience, it's very hard to have in the the world of Twitter and Facebook and immediate gratification, having your audience go back and, hey, you know what? Can you go back and watch Superman 1 and Superman 2 that happened over 30 years ago? I think... Like, you, it's very hard to ask your audience to go do their homework when you're trying yeah. to introduce a new Superman. Even if it is the Christopher Reeve Superman, you're, you're resuscitating or bringing back to life. Um, I think that's where you lost – well, I, that's where I think Brian Singer lost most of his audience. Um, was could, that – oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you could probably do that now. Yeah. Because yeah. we are living in the age of, like, the legacy sequel. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Yeah, it's it was just a different time. And I think, like, because I remember a couple of my family and friends going, Superman has a kid? Like, what are you talking about? When, you, when, when Jason throws the piano across the room, they're like, when did this happen? Well, you didn't see Superman 2. So, and like... Then, and then it's like, didn't, you know? And then it's like... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, because I remember, like, you know, the big thing being, well, this takes place after Superman 2. Mm -hmm. Three and four don't count. Right. And you're kind of like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, and then because at the same time is when they released the Donner cut of Superman 2. Yeah. And just being like, oh, okay. So now they're really kind of throwing away (laughs) continuity and what could Uh be. And so, yeah, I mean. Yeah, I mean. I just I think what Brian Singer did I I like that he kept the Richard Donner aesthetic. I like that he kept the heart of Superman. Um you know, I have a little bit of gripes with the costume in that film, but I mean that I wish the cape was different cuz it looks like a shower curtain on his neck, you know. The, the cape uh, and the high collar are the two yeah. that I don't like the most. I didn't have a problem with the raised ass. Um, I didn't have a problem with the trunks. I just felt like they used the S too many times. It felt redundant on the chest and on the belt and on the soles of his shoes. I mean, they had S's all over the place. but And then not on the back of his cape. Yeah, I missed... Like, I, <laughs> you put it everywhere, but, but not I on still, the back of the cape. I still say the best-looking costume, and I own a bunch of them, so uh, I'm partial. The best-looking costume was the Superboy costume from seasons three and four. Like, it's it's the most accurate. It is the most comic book, like, accurate costume to date. And I will probably never see a, a, a costume like that ever again. I mean, other than Brandon Routh's Kingdom Come costume from Crisis, those two are the m- most accurate uh, in the, what, how many years has Superman been on film and television? And, like, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, even Tyler Hecklin's Golden Age costume. It took how many years to finally get that costume in live action? Oh, so that was, that was such a great scene. Oh yeah, it's amazing. That show's so amazing. And uh, what I love about that show is I feel like they sat down and they're like, okay, what do we like about every version of this character? And then they like worked on crafting like a greatest hits version. Like from imagery, parts, and just beats, they're like from every version of this character, what worked and what didn't. And oh yeah, gonna, and we're going to incorporate that into what we're doing. Oh yeah, I mean Todd Helbing and his production team. It doesn't even look like a CW show. No, nope. I remember that those first five minutes sitting down and watching and going, oh, wow. And I sent that to Gerard. I sent that to Stacy. I'm like, you guys got to watch this. This is amazing. And uh, It was just like you said. It was like all the best, the 80 years history of Superman was like distilled through a crucible and was like, hey, you know what? This is what makes Superman Superman. You either like it or you don't, you know? Um, The aesthetic is very Man of Steel, very Zack Snyder. I don't have a problem with that. I think think where most writers and directors fault or fail with Superman – and I've said this thousands and thousands of times, and I'm sure you have said this, Tyler, Probably. is that Superman, you can't make like Batman. He's not right. dark. He's not brooding. He's not – he is the light in the darkness. He is the beacon of hope. And the problem I had with Zack Snyder's – and again, I'm not treading I'm, – I'm not being hateful of – people or fans who love Henry Cavill as Superman. I like him too. I just feel like he's not utilized in the proper way as the character. Um, Zack Snyder um, is a great director. Visually, he has a great eye, uh, but he doesn't understand Superman. And I remember interviews of him doing Watchmen saying, I would never touch Superman with a 10-foot pole because he is the granddaddy of superheroes and I don't think I could do him justice. Uh, but the problem with his Superman is they talk about it in Man of Steel. You are the beacon of light. You are the savior of the human race. You could save them if you want to, Cal. But we never really got to see it. It was all like off camera. Yeah. Yeah. And the 
the the great this is the perfect metaphor for Henry Cavill Superman is the woman in the flood reaching out to Superman and him hovering 10 feet or whatever you want to say above the house and her reaching out for Superman and him just being an arm length away. That is how I would like to describe Henry Cavill Superman. Just out of reach, he likes humanity. I shouldn't even say likes humanity, but he questions humanity. And like, I mean, he said it in Man of Steel. Like, I can't trust Zod, but I can't trust the human race either. And it was always that seed of doubt with his his version of Superman. Like, is this what I should be doing? Am I following uh, Russell Crowe's Jarrell? Like, his wish fulfillment? Like, like I, I don't know what I should be doing. Or even the dialogue in Man of Steel with Jonathan Kent, with Kevin Costner, who was perfectly cast, but that stupid line of dialogue of him going, maybe you shouldn't save him, Clark, was like, what are you talking about? So... I mean, I look at Man of Steel. It's not a bad film. I love two-thirds of that movie. I look at that film as the sci-fi version of a Superman story. Or, like, I love what David Goyer has said about Man of Steel. If you approach Man of Steel as, like, the day the Earth stood, stood still, especially the scene where he's in the, the desert with Lois and the army and the Kryptonian ship is coming, and it was really, like, out of the day the Earth stood still. Yeah. And Feora's coming down the, the walkway of the ship. That was amazing. I love the sci-fi aspect of Man of Steel and the, the different elements that they set up that they never really got to pay off. I love the idea of the Codex. and yeah, that you're very correct, yes. They didn't get to pay off. And they didn't of, get to pay it off because I know, like, some of the... Some of the ideas was that Brainiac was going to come in Man of Steel and that the, he was going to use the Codex to resuscitate or re, re, uh, regrow Krypton. But in the midst of doing that was going to create Bizarro. That would have been amazing. That would have been really cool to see. So, yeah, I mean, but, you know, Zack Snyder had to get his Batman in. He loves Batman. Oh, he and loves that, Batman. So. Yeah, I'm, I, I agree. Like, you... You don't approach the characters the same way because they're not the same person. Right. They're not the same character. Like, right? They have completely different lo- well, outlooks on things. And, mm-hmm. um, and I always said, like, to my wife, like, if I was filming a Superman movie, I always thought it'd be kind of neat to make the the costume ridiculously bright, and then you and then you film everything with a darker green filter, as and the idea would be that the world is dark, but then you know even with the costume so bright that even with the dark filter, it's still bright to make him stand out even more as if he's bringing the light. And then throughout the film, mm-hmm. you kind of show things get brighter. Yeah. Um, and the idea, you know, it's just from the visual is like, you know, the world is dark, but then you have this dude walking, standing tall in this bright suit. Mm-hmm. Who's not afraid to stand out to call attention to. Yeah. Um, I, always, well, I, I love the whole kill bill. Uh, the Quentin Tarantino monologue that they did in Kill Bill Volume 1 about the difference between Clark Kent and Superman. Clark Kent is Kal-El's way of how he sees humanity and him trying to fit in. That's his idea of what humanity is and how he chooses to walk among us. But as Superman, he is the beacon. He He is what we all aspire to be, which is the Superman. Like... So I that's I love that. If you haven't, go check that out. There's a clip up on YouTube. Say, yeah, there's gotta be a clip it's on YouTube. It's so good. Like uh, there's a, there's another filmmaker I would love to see his version of Superman, uh, Quentin Tarantino. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm gonna ask myself a question. If I had a choice of a director for Superman, it would be Matthew Vaughn. I would see, love to see what Matthew Vaughn can do with dude, Superman, dude. That okay. So years ago, I just interviewed myself. Sorry, Tyler. I love it. I love it. No, no, I love it because I did my pitch years uh-huh. ago uh, on this podcast of what Man of Steel two would be, right? And it was, I think, it was before Justice League, and we were pitching like what we do for Man of Steel two. If and it was one of the things was like if you didn't have like Zack Snyder or whatever, I said Matthew Vaughn would, was my pick, and the villain was Brainiac played by Javier Bardem. Um, and I always, because I've always loved Matthew Vaughn's aesthetic. The other choice I had was I think this person deserves another shot at something live action is, um, what am I mind? Brad Bird. 
Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. You know who did the From Iron the Giant? He did yeah. the Incredibles. The Iron I love Giant. The Incredibles. Yeah. And then he did um, Ghost Protocol for Mission Impossible. Oh wow! I didn't know that. Wow. And you know, and then he did Tomorrowland, which tanked. Yeah. And he hasn't done live action since. And I said, I think he has a sensibility um, that would be great for Superman. And he was my second choice as director. Two two really solid picks. I didn't even I I love The Incredibles. I didn't think The Incredibles two was as good as the first one, but it wasn't. But uh, I love that first Incredibles movie. I mean, there's parts of the second one I really like too. But like, yeah, Brad Bird would be perfect. Um, I love Matthew Vaughn because of what he did with the X Men in yep. First Class. First and Class is my favorite X Men movie. It is such an underrated X-Men film. I love Kevin Bacon in that movie as the villain. He was fantastic. Um, I like James McAvoy as per- Professor X and Michael Fassenbender. What he had to do with X-Men First Class and having to recast the X-Men, I think, was he did a phenomenal job. So He did a phenomenal job to the movie that they didn't because that was, you know, at the time of the MCU that mm-hmm. – they didn't really promote it. There was yeah. nothing really for that movie, and mm-hmm. it just kind of like was disappeared, you know? Yeah. And the cast resurfaced in the Brian Singer, Days of Future Past, you know, mashup film. But I love what Matthew Vaughn's done with Kingsman because if you yeah. ever – if you read the Kingsman Secret Service comic book uh, by Mark Miller, it's so bare bones. Uh-huh. And Matthew Vaughn really took that, elevated the material, <laughs> and has made that into his own thing. Like uh-huh. I haven't got a chance to go see – the new one, The King's Man. Yeah, I, um, I haven't seen it yet either. But I, I you know, the other night, uh, my wife showed the kid Stardust, oh, which wow. was Matthew Vaughn. Um, when I think his second movie, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, oh. I think he's a really talented filmmaker with a great aesthetic that he brings. Yeah. And I, I, and I feel like he understands the Superman character. He understands the heartbeat of the character, as opposed to let's make him. You know, dour and mopey and saying to Lois, nobody stays good in this world. Like, come on. That's not Superman. I, I love Henry Cavill. Does, don't get me wrong. It's just he has not had scripts written by people. I, I mean, David Goyer's hit or miss. But, like, yes. he, he, doesn't have, he doesn't have a script writer or a director that understands the heartbeat of the character. And that's it. Uh, and I'll stay, I'll stay by that. Um, if he had uh, Todd Helbing and that production team from Superman and Lois behind him, my God, I think Superman would still be on the silver screen right now flying around. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, and I, I mean, Superman's one of those characters that if you're going to try to do a take, and I always hate that when people say, well, this is our take on the character. My first thought is, what are you changing? Because yeah. if, you're, if you're doing a take, uh-huh. it means you're going to have to change things or rearrange or – Right. Uh, manipulate. I mean, Smallville was, he's not Superman yet. We're not doing Superboy. This is his growth. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Superman and Lois says, hey, this is him later on in life. Yeah. At a point where we've never seen him. Like, he's had these battles with Lex. He has this history. Mm-hmm. But now he's a dad, and this is where he's going this way. So that is a take in the sense of we're moving the character forward. Well, <sighs> Well, I think I think with Superman Returns and even Man of Steel, it's like they tread it over water that we've already been down or we've already we've seen the origin so many times. We've seen this, this and this. And it's right. like, OK, we, it's like Batman. Right. We've seen the Waynes get killed how many different times through Gotham. Batman begins. The Joker. Uh, why the do we Joker. have to see? Why do we right. need that in that movie? Batman versus Superman. We saw it again. And it's like, OK, we get it. And I'm sure we'll see it in the Batman come this March. I wonder, uh, though. Yeah. I wonder to myself, like, if, <laughs> if, if if they do that or if it's just, like, yeah. talked about. Because I'm wondering if Matthew uh, – Matt Reeves has been, like, you know, I hear people complaining that they've seen this Wayne murder too much. You know, we uh-huh. might just kind of move away from that yeah. and just kind of reference it. Yeah. And I, I just feel like if – like, with a new Superman film, you don't have to do all that. Like, you know what? Let's just hit the ground running. Let's just, like, we'll, we'll, we'll shoot. And that's what I love about Superman and Lois. It is treading new water. We're, we're blazing a new path. 80 years of the character either in the comics or on film or on television, they are distilling through a crucible. They're 
picking and choosing, but they're not telling you outright, oh, you know what? When Superboy created Bizarro at the Schuster University Labs, that never happened. Mm -hmm. It still could happen. Yeah. You know? So that's what I love about Superman and Lois. They're not, they're not pigeon holding themselves into a corner, but they're embracing much like Superboy, the adventures of Superboy did, like the entire comic book universe. They're not saying, well, you know what? We're not taking Mixus Pitalik and developing an episode with him because that character is just too campy and it doesn't make any sense because we want to tell uh, uh, the college years of Superboy and he didn't meet Mixus Pitalik until he was Superman. You know, forget that. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Michael J. Pollard, God rest his soul. You know, we just lost him a couple years ago. Um, I met him at a convention with his agent and I went up to him and I had a picture from Hollywood book and posters and Michael uh, grew up here in Chicago and he says to me, he's like, Sam, how do you remember this show? <laughs> so You're and like, I, remember oh, I, his, I, I remember his agent looking at me and looking because I had a DC direct Mixus Pedelec statue, one of these little mini statues nice. with me and I had the photo and they loved it. They're like, can we get more of these statues? I'm like, no. Like, it, there's just the one here. But I'm sure you, if you walked around the convention, you probably could find one. But uh, Hollywood Book and Posters was at that convention at in Anaheim back in 2010. Uh, and they got a bunch of copies, and they sold all those photos. Sorry, I'm, I'm going back to Superboy. I'm, no, it's full I love circle. it. Full exactly. circle. But you know, uh, no, you're right because it, it's about the way you you yeah take the story for what it is. Like you know, I was gonna say like I always thought if I if I was if they were like Tyler, mm-hmm. we're gonna do Superman, we're gonna do the movie. What would yeah. you do? I would completely skip Krypton. My um, first my first Superman movie would be more about grounding, yeah. like the, like the Smallville into Metropolis, and then my second film would mm-hmm. be kind of like. It would my second film would open with the flashback of Krypton. So yeah. like he is kind of like as the audience we're discovering Krypton as he does, instead of having this huge like Krypton scene, and then going into it, it's like you're kind of, um, you know, in in sort of the way that Smallville kind of started with his crash and then moved forward and then, um, you know, Lois and Clark like kind yeah. of move forward. I always thought that'd be kind of interesting to see this journey of mm-hmm. the character on film, of having not the Krypton uh, past, but yeah, my dogs are barking. Krypton. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> oh, the doorbell's being rung. <laughs> it's okay, Ty. <laughs> I know who it is. Oh, okay. Um, not, five bucks says it's the little girl next door trying to see if the kids want to come out and play. <laughs> but they're not because they got to clean their room. The great um, thing is you could edit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or just leave it in because that's the crazy. That's fine. Yeah, that. that's fine. Um, <laughs> But the character, you know, has been around so long, and oh, yeah. there are so many different ways to approach it. And the last thing I was going to say to you, mm-hmm. did you watch the newest episode of Superman and Lois? You know what? I bought the season pass on iTunes. I, I buy the season passes on iTunes because I, I love watching the episodes without the commercial breaks. Me too. That's, um, what, that's what I do. Uh, we do – well, now the kids are in school, but when they weren't in school, we would do Wednesday morning breakfast – Mm-hmm. Where I'd make breakfast, we'd all sit and eat breakfast and watch the episode yeah. uh, as a family. The reason why I asked, this isn't a spoiler, it's something to keep your eye on. Yeah. There's a there's a scene where the camera passes in Smallville and there's a vendor selling Superman like merch. Yeah. If you look on the side of the table, it seems like it looks like it's up against a fence, is a red cape with a yellow S on the back. Oh wow. And I pointed that out. I actually just put the picture because I snapped my computer screen up and I put it on uh, the Facebook because I'm saying um, – I pointed out like, okay, this is something because, you know, in my headcanon right now is Krypton the series is a prequel to this. Yeah. That's yeah. my headcanon. And someone posted, well, he doesn't have the right cape. I'm like, not yet. Mm-hmm. But they can always get a new cape in a new season. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. And – Someone pointed out on social media uh, today saying, what if that is an allusion to that's the cape that John Henry might get and Dawn? Interesting. Um, yeah. And I'm like, and I'm like, cool. But I'm like, just the fact that it's there mm-hmm. is an interesting thought of where uh, this could go. Yeah. But I think we're going to put a plug in it here, Sam, because the okay, yeah, the, the dogs are going crazy and it's they've okay. been going for a little while. And I think <laughs> we could probably talk forever. 
Well, and I think my well, my dogs have been well behaved. They they've been so quiet. They're asleep right now, so this is great. <laughs> uh, the, the doorbell has awoken. That's okay. And well, Scooby. Well, I just want to say, Tyler, thank you for having me on the Krypton Report. It's been so much fun. I, like you said, we could talk for hours. This is amazing. Um, thank you, Sam. Like you bring such a great knowledge of, like I, like I say, like a part of my super fandom that I know little about. Mm-hmm. And so it's exciting for me to hear all this about Superboy and the fact that I'm even more limited on what I get to watch because it's not on DC Universe because DC Universe is not around and it's not on HBO. Um, well, so. I was going to say, Sam, just go ahead and plug um, all your social media, where they can find your podcast and your YouTube and all that fun. Yeah, if you just go on YouTube at youtube.com slash superboylegacy, the entire channel, podcast episodes, live streams are up there. We're kind of taking a break right now from recording. Um, I'm going to put – I have some commentary stuff that we did a couple months back with Michael Mano. That's going to go up this week. Um, Shout out to my co-host, Tom Gallagher. David Arroyo and Chris Jacobson, like those guys are amazing. Uh, Aaron Price, who does my graphics, and John Fent, those guys are amazing. Go check out their Instagrams and YouTube uh, channels; they're so good. Um, Tyler, again, thank you for having me on. Uh, for anything Superboy Legacy, go to SuperboyLegacy.com. You will not miss anything. We have a ton of stuff coming up. New episodes are coming. Um, I'm lining up interviews with Julia Pastor, Gerard Christopher's finally coming on, uh, Stacey Hyduke. Like season two is coming. We are we're gonna scale down the live streams every once in a while, and our interviews are gonna be uh, pre-recorded, and we are going to do a really. We're just gonna go completely out on the interviews, adding graphics, adding. Uh, little tidbits and all this stuff to make those episodes really pop for the Superboy community and Superboy fans. So I can't wait to start season two. We're going to start that very, very soon. So just stick with us on SuperboyLegacy.com. And Tyler, again, thank you for having me on the Krypton Report. Again, I could talk for hours. So thank you. You're welcome. It's our pleasure. We're we're glad to have you and talk about this. And I look forward to season two of your podcast uh, probably just as much as anybody else who listens to it. Um, and, and Ty, thank you for the years of support and, uh, you know, sending me, like, great messages. I remember when I was at the Superman celebration in the summertime and you just messaging me going, Sam, like, this weekend, like, it's it's so awesome to see you up there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, like, I'm just like everybody else. I, I, I... I'm so grateful over the support from the fans and even the cast and the crew of Superboy and just being the being somebody that gets to keep this Superboy train going because uh, I love the show. And to bring new fans to the party, it's just amazing. So thank you, everybody. Look up in the sky. Do you like movies? Of course you do. Do you like comic book movies? Of course you do. Well, our Patreon is launched now. It's a dollar a month. That's all we ask. One dollar a month to hear great content. And right now, one of the biggest things we're doing on our Patreon is movie commentaries. I am a movie person, and I love to talk about movie. So what we're doing is at least two movie commentaries a month. You'll hear the wonderful voice of my wife, Jania, more often. And other special shows. Check out our Patreon at kryptonreport.com slash Patreon. And all we ask is, hey, $1. It helps us keep the show on. We're not looking to get rich. We just help with the cost of doing this, and it helps a friend out. You loan a friend a dollar, you probably have a dollar lying around the house and change. So check out patreon.com slash kryptonreport. Sign up for the $1 a month and send us a message. You can be on the podcast. We can talk about something, anything you want to talk about. You can join us for a movie commentary. If you want, so check it out. And if you want to have a good time, keep listening to the Krypton Report. If you're enjoying this podcast, here's some of our favorite podcasts to check out. Digging for Kryptonite, The Aspiring Kryptonian, Superman the Animated Podcast, The Last Sons of Krypton, The Geek of Steel, The All-Star Super Fan Podcast, It All Comes Back to Superman, and Superboy Legacy, Supergirl Radio, and of course, Always Hold On to Smallville. Check all those out, enjoy those supercasts, and remember, keep listening. Krypton Report is a Tears production.
We thank you for listening and enjoying, and please support us on our Patreon account, our Tee Public store, and check out our social media. Always remember to look up in the sky.